Hello, welcome to this lecture on vaccines. Before going on to this lecture, let us recapitulate some of the basic facts about the immune response. So, if one looks at immune responses to pathogens, we went through in the earlier lectures that the bacteria that replicate within the wound site, for example, in this slide it is a tissue damage due to the pricking of a thorn, the bacteria that multiply within that site actually secrete certain material which are chemotactic for the cells of the innate immune system, basically macrophages and leukocytes that migrate to the site of bacterial replication with the ultimate goal of phagocytosing this bacteria. So, if you were to look at the immune system per se, you have two arms of the immune system called as the innate and acquired. The innate immunity participating in certain reactions such as lysosome secretion, chemotaxis and importantly the activation of complement due to the binding of the immunoglobulin molecules with their specific antigen via the FC portion of the immunoglobulin molecule. The activation of the complement itself causes further chemotaxic due to the release of complement fragments and allow these macrophages to come to the site of bacterial replication or immune complex mediated complement activation. Of course, the other components are NK cells and the secretion of various kinds of lymphokines which by themselves are non-specific so far as the immune response is concerned, but they are specific to their receptors such as interferons, IL-2 and so on and so forth. In addition to this of course, this is supported by the acquired immune arm of the immune system that is initiated as a result of several innate immune reactions including the response or binding of various ligands to the toll like receptors which are an important part of the innate immunity. The, in, the acquired immune system of course, has the participation of B cells for the secretion of specific antibodies that recognize the specific antigen. If it is a toxin, it is anti toxin or if it is antibacterial there are different polyclonal antibodies that are secreted in the serum that will bind to the bacterial surface antigens. In addition to this of course, the activation of T cells by the presentation of antigens via the dendritic cells or antigen presenting cells leads to cooperation of with the B cells for the secretion of specific antibodies as well as the activation of several kinds of T cell mediated immune responses such as cytotoxic T cells as well as T helper cells. So, all this is of course, to ensure that there is diversity of the immune response. So, that the immune response can recognize multitude of antigens having recognized a multitude of antigens or pathogenic infections the immune system is endowed with a memory to remember that it, it had come down or faced a similar infection earlier in the life of the individual and therefore, is able to respond faster by the secretion of IgG responses of the right type of so far as affinity maturation is concerned. And of course, the self non self recognition via the MHC molecule. So, therefore, if efforts were to be tried or put into action that would result in protection of the individual which is what vaccination is all about. Vaccine stands for vaca meaning cow because that was that was in the history when Edward Jenner used these cow cowpox uh, uh, material to immunize uh, various people. So, therefore, in the Latin the word cow uh, stands for vaca and therefore, it was named as vaccination at that time. So, 
If you look at vaccination then, you must then use approaches that will help to strengthen the immune response, so that it is prepared for an incoming infection. And the various places where the immune system can be strengthened is of course, the macrophage in terms of innate immunity itself. So, therefore, the activation of the immune innate immunity either by causing better phagocytosis or by activation of macrophages by opsonization or immune stimulating complexes or activating the process of antigen presentation itself by providing the right kind of uh, cytokines and the right kind of antigens that would then stimulate both the T cells and the B cell of arms of the immune system. Also, it so happens that these T helper cells and the reactions that they orchestrate is different from individual to individual because the MHC haplotype itself is different and therefore, as we went into in the earlier classes, there seems to be diversity in individuals responding to different kinds of peptides that are bound to the MHC complex. In other words, all of us are not equal in the way we respond to various kinds of antigens or even various kinds of protein antigens from the same virus. And therefore, one ends up being either susceptible or resistant to a particular uh, kind of infection. Therefore, vaccination approaches have to deal with this sort of heterogeneity also and of late one speaks about personalized medicine, where one takes into account the genetic sequence of an individual in order to find out how that person is going to respond to a particular infection or a particular pathogen. B, cell, B cells of course, there is a lot of algorithms to find out what sort of epitopes are suitable for a protective immune response and these approaches are being put into action in order to in order to uh, make vaccines that are better able to make protective antibodies. But of course, the sum total of protection needs the participation of helper T cells and therefore, this sort of heterogeneity in how T cells respond to various kinds of antigens need to be looked into. So, going on further looking at the aspect of vaccination itself or immunization or to strengthen the immune response against infections. Vaccination could be defined as the process of immunization meaning active immunization vis a vis the injection of a particular material into the person. So, that it enables a rapid immune response preferably with memory. So, it can be long lasting against a particular infectious agent. As I alluded to earlier, Edward Jenner and Louis Pasteur began this whole process of vaccination in history. Now, this vaccination has now been tried out and has been found to be successful in the case of diphtheria, measles, pertussis which causes whooping cough, rubella, poliomyelitis as well as tetanus. All these diseases have decreased following the onset of vaccination efforts. Now, since 1977, smallpox is practically non-existent. Other diseases that are pathogens that require attention because they have not been able to eradicate, eradicate them is hepatitis B virus, malaria, diarrheal diseases, tuberculosis, HIV of course, all these kinds of diseases need attention. And the more complicated the pathogen, the more complicated becomes the effort to vaccinate against it. So, what are the features of a vaccine? The vaccine must be safe to use in terms of not causing the disease by itself. It must be protective against the pathogen and this protection should last for a fairly long time and it should lead to increased neutralizing antibodies. Neutralizing antibodies are the ones that confer protection against a particular disease. Neutralizing stands for those type of antibodies that bind to a virus or a pathogen and stops it from infecting a particular cell. It neutralizes the virus and therefore, it is going to be protective. As we know an 
uh, a humoral immune response that is orchestrated against any pathogenic infection can lead to the elicitation of antibodies. However, these antibodies need not always be protective. There can be antibodies that are against surface antigens of, uh, of a particular pathogen, but it will not stop its infection. In fact, there are types of antibodies called as antibody dependent enhancement phenomena, where these anti binding of these antibodies actually increases the infection uh, in a particular individual by binding to FC receptors and so on. So, therefore, protective T cells also have to be activated as an essential feature of any vaccine that is thought about. And of course, this is something that needs to be addressed, it has to be relatively cheap, it should be stable and easy to administer and should have of course, least side effects. It should be relatively cheap since many of the poor developing countries need to afford them. They should be stable because they have to be stored for long periods of time. One cannot afford to make these vaccines in a complicated using all the complicated uh, uh, procedures that I am going to describe in the next few slides. It cannot be done so easily all the time. So, they have to be uh, they have to be stored for some time at some place in order to be used for a long period of time. And so, there should be they should be stable and of course, they should be easy to administer because children are the ones that, that receive these many uh, children are in may, in a majority of cases are the ones that, that receive these uh, uh, vaccination uh, uh, attempts or, or, or against various uh, pathogens. And of course, they should have least side effects, because if they have side effects, then everybody is afraid to take the vaccine and the vaccine becomes useless. And also as you will see, many of these vaccination effect effects, some small side effects that are reported, which may not even be due to the, to the vaccination attempt per se, but due to other causes can lead to a lot of public reaction that will cause the vaccination to be withdrawn for a small period of time before of course, it is ascertained that the vaccination was safe in the first place. But this withdrawing of vaccination actually causes these diseases to spurt back again and it involves a term called as herd immunity which, which I will try to cover as we go on. What are the types of immunization that one, that one uh, refers to? These immunization actually fall into two categories called as passive and active immunization. Passive immunization provides immediate protection to individuals against pathogens as in transfer of preformed antibodies. This is something that is resorted to when immediate protection is, re, is, is needed. For example, during snake bites you need to have antibodies against the snake venom and they have to be administered as soon as the snake bite occurs. There is no point in having a vaccination for snake bites prior, uh, before itself, because all, uh, all the population is not likely to be bitten by snakes. So, therefore, those who are in danger, who have been bitten by snakes at that point in time, they have to have access to this sort of anti sera which can be administered passively. As opposed to passive immunization, active immunization stimulates the immune system such that the first infection is treated as a re exposure. In other words, this becomes a secondary episode rather than a primary exposure to the antigen itself or, or the infection. So, what are the features or what are the properties of passive immunization? It is used for ben immediate benefits because it is just transferred from let us say a, a, a pure antibody that has been prepared and stored in a vial, because it has been transferred into an individual, it has no way of inducing memory because it is just antibodies. So, T cells are not activated and therefore, memory T cells or memory B cells are not going to be activated, because the person's B cells of the immune system is not activated against, against the uh, uh, venom or toxin. The another example of passive immunization is are maternal antibodies. Maternal antibodies that are protected 
in the uh, uh, in the womb such as going across the placenta like IgG maternal IgG that can cross the placenta and protect the fetus from various kinds of infections that is coming from the maternal blood stream. It also has to do with the transfer of antibodies through, through the maternal milk during breastfeeding. So, many of these antibodies against newborn infants are actually transferred through maternal, uh, maternal milk during breastfeeding feeding. and these are protective antibodies that protect infants against a variety of infections. So, such maternal antibodies are protective against diphtheria, tetanus, streptococci, rubiola, rubella, mumps and polio virus. Of course, in addition to this one has to consider that in various situations or various parts of the world everybody is not 100 percent healthy. In other words there could be regions where there is malnourishment. In such situations mothers who are, who are malnourished will all will not be able to confer 100 per percent protection to infants because of deficient transfer or deficient secretion of this kind of antibodies that are needed for the infant. Usually horse antiserum is used for protection against various kinds of toxins especially tetanus toxoid. Tetanus all of you probably remember that if, if, uh, um, uh, if a boy falls in the, in the football ground he is immediately taken to the doctor for a tetanus injection because you can have toxin production uh, if the wound gets infected uh, and tetanus toxin is actually very very dangerous. And of course as I mentioned snake bites. The way one, one uh, makes antiserum to uh, snake, uh, snake venom is to take very very diluted or very very small portions of these, uh, of these venom and inject it into horse so that the horses do not die of the dose that is given. And slowly the dose over a period of time because the horse ends up making antibodies. So, the second time you inject the same venom it makes more antibodies and so on and so forth up till a, up till a time when this horse serum has got a sufficiently high titer of uh, snake, uh, snake venom uh, antibodies. Now, the problem with passive immunization is that transfer of these antibodies into humans always elicits a reaction against the transferred antibodies, because all of us um, uh, make antibodies to foreign species and in fact, that is how for uh, various kinds of diagnostic kits one makes antibodies like in ELISA you make antibodies to uh, uh, various kind, kinds of uh, uh, let us say uh, sheep antibodies or made in, in rabbits and rabbit antibodies are made in, uh, in the goat by injecting purified uh, rabbit antibodies and so on. And therefore, when horse horse antibodies anti sera are given to the humans, the humans end up making antibodies to that horse antibodies and that creates compli complications. Not only does it uh, inhibit the action of the horse antibodies over a period of time, it will also end up making the person uh, allergic or you can have systemic anaphylaxis and there could be a lot of these complement mediated complex uh, complexes and which lead to type 3 mediated hypersensitivity reactions. In addition to that of course, these antibodies can elicit what are called as anti allotypic antibodies which is which are directed against the allotype of the FC portion of the immunoglobulins of the horse. And therefore, these passive immunizations are resorted to only when there is a requirement for immediate effect. Um, and can and is not preferred to be used for uh, 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 giving protection over a long period of time. So, what are the examples that are involving passive immunization? These horse antiseras actually have been used against black widow spider bites, snake bites, botulism, diphtheria as well as tetanus. The other hand organisms like hepatitis A and B, measles, rabies and tetanus have been combated with pooled human immune gamma globulin. So, in other words people who are immune to such viruses they have anti sera against, against these viruses. So, that immune anti sera is pooled from various kinds of individuals and given to individuals or infants who are suffering from these in a in a in a in a acute in an acute phase of the disease. In other words 
when the clinician thinks that, uh, that the disease has gone too far and cannot be protected simply by by intervention by injection of various kinds of either drugs or or other kinds of vaccines one resorts to this kind of passive immunization. Now, coming to active immunization, active immunization is the process of immunizing an individual with the pathogen or pathogenic material itself. Now, you cannot inject pathogenic materials by themselves because they themselves will cause disease. Therefore, that pathogen or bacteria or virus has to be killed or it has to be attenuated. Attenuated attenuation is the process of weakening the capacity of the organism to cause disease. It is done of course, by passaging these or making these viruses grow in different kinds of tissues or different kinds of cells other than what is supposed to be its natural host. So, these this active immunization ends up activating the immune system and in many cases establishes, me, establishes memory. This memory of course, in many in many cases need not be established also. So, one ends up trying to look for approaches or candidate vaccines that actually establishes memory because one cannot go on re-immunizing individuals although that has to be done in many situations. <coughs> Vaccination has been beneficial in children. Example hepatitis B virus, haemophilus influenza, varicella zoster vaccine has been used for chicken pox, DPT is very famous, the diphtheria pertussis toxin tetanus to vaccine, OPV which is the uh, Sabine trivalent oral polio vaccine which is delivered orally, OPV stands for oral polio vaccine, MMR, MMR stands for measles, mumps and rubella. This immunization of infants actually can begin as early as 2 months of age, but in different geographical regions of the world and depending upon the immunity of the population, different protocols needs to be followed for different vaccines. And of course, protocols could differ very much in adults compared to infants. Now, the factor that complicates this issue of the time of immunization is actually the maternal antibodies that are transferred. These antibodies actually because they are binding to these different kinds of pathogens that are transferred from the mother, they can actually bind to the epitopes of the administered vaccine if it is a killed bacteria or attenuated bacteria. And therefore, the ability of the killed bacteria to elicit an immune response in the newborn becomes weaker. So, therefore, clinicians actually look at what time period this, this vaccination has to be put into effect depending upon the prevalence or the, uh, uh, the type of antibodies or maternal antibodies that are there in the newborn, which is passively protecting the newborn against the same kind of organisms. Therefore, in such situations when the injected vaccine is not as efficient, more boosters may be required in children and the timing could differ in different regions of the world depending upon whether the mother is malnourished or whether the infant is immunosuppressed and so on. Usually MMR is given only at 12 months of age, oral polio is given multiple times to improve the response to three different strains which are there in this Sabine oral, oral polio vaccine and because of this more number of boosters are required because the, the immune system responds by making antibodies to one uh, the one strain towards one strain of this vaccine and then next the other strain uh, elicits the formation of antibodies and finally the third strain elicits the formation of antibodies <coughs> so vaccines for infants and children some of these examples are given here for hepatitis B vaccine, it is birth to 2 months, DPT, OPV and uh, the B antigen of Haemophilus, uh, this is HIB, to OPV and HIB, it is 2 months 
and um, DPT, OP, o, OPV and Haemophilus influenza B antigen 4 months of age, hepatitis B, OPV it is about 6, 6 to 18 months and so on and so forth. Some of these characters I have just listed out here and as I was telling you in the previous slide ages at which this vaccine is administered could vary depending upon the immune status and geographical region of the <coughs> place. Attenuated meaning as I told you it is a virulent it is not able to cause the disease. Now, the ability of attenuated organisms activates both B and T cells. Examples are TB they have used it in the case of TB, yellow fever virus, measles, mumps, varicella, polio. Now, in the case of BCG which is a well known uh, vaccine which has been successful in some parts of the world, but it has been unsuccessful in many parts of the world including India. This vaccine is nothing but mycobacterial bovis, mycobacterium bovis which has been grown in increasing bile concentration for about 13 years. It has resulted in several uh, mutations that has attenuated the mycobacteria. The Sabine polio vaccine has been prepared from passaging or growing polio virus in monkey kidney epithelial cells. The measles vaccine is the rubella grown in duck embryo cells. So, some of these attenuated organisms do have a chance of reverting back, but the chances of a possible reversion are 1 in 4 million. But this has come up from time to time in the history of vaccination and caused a lot of problems in terms of withdrawal of vaccines. Such preparation of attenuated uh, viruses or pathogens can also be contaminated. For example, in monkey when one grows in monkey kidney cells SP40 virus is uh, a, a contaminant that can come up uh, with some of these preparations. So, one has to examine um, these particular vaccine batches in order to remove uh, those which are contaminated with contaminants like SV40 virus. The other complication is the post vaccine encephalitis in some of these measles vaccine. For example, in the Edmonston Zagreb strain is immunogenic in 4 to 6 month infants, but it causes endemic disorders in Senegal and Haiti because of possible immune suppression of these infants in those regions. So, therefore, the immune system of the one of, of individuals who are be, being vaccinated is also important when one uses attenuated strains, because if, if an individual is immune suppressed then an attenuated organism can, can retain or develop a capacity to cause uh, damage or, or the pathogen so called becomes infective in an immunosuppressed individual. Nowadays of course, genetic engineering is being used to attenuate viruses completely. So, that rather than relying on the natural process of passaging or growing these viruses in different kinds of tissues in order to cause attenuation which is ultimately due to different kinds of mutations, why not cause the mutations by design. So, you mutate pathogenic uh, antigens or viruses that are involved in making a virus virulent and make them non virulent. You can also choose some of these genes that you would like to mutate, so that they will not be able to revert back again. So, some of these uh, approaches involve the removal of thymidine kinase gene in the case of herpes for vaccination in pigs. As opposed to these kind of act attenuated organisms killed vaccines activated activate humoral responses only and there they do not response but they do not they do not activate memory responses and hence they need more boosters they are deficient iga and cell mediated responses when one use killed preparations some of the examples are cholera plague plague pertussis influenza sarc polio vaccine rubella this killing can be achieved by heating by thermal denaturation 
but of course, in many cases thermal denaturation may destroy many of the epitopes that may require. In such cases chemicals such as formaldehyde, uh, hydrogen peroxide and alkylating agents are used. Purified or isolated components, you can purify material from bacteria, large amounts, need, uh, large amounts can be purified and for example, in the case of toxins, diphtheria and tetanus toxoids, capsular polysaccharides from hemo haemophilus influenzae type B has been has been uh, purified and they have been coupled to tetanus toxoid carrier because tetanus toxoid also acts as an adjuvant. We will come to that a little later on being very highly immunogenic by itself. This carrier coupling enables T helper activation for the establishment of memory because capsular or polysaccharides are thymic or T independent response activating type of antigens. So, therefore, one needs to activate T helper cells which can be uh, done by coupling these antigens to tetanus toxide which by itself is very very immunogenic and causes T helper activation. Other cases are Neisseria meningitis, Streptococcus pneumoniae which has 23 different kinds of uh, uh, polysaccharides that can be used and the hepatitis B surface antigen itself. One of the important aspects of using polysaccharides is of course, that these polysaccharides are used by these bacteria in order to evade macrophage mediated uh, phagocytosis. In fact, that is one of the reasons why some of the antibodies that are made to incoming bacteria, they are made against polysaccharides. So, they can go and bind to the pathogens and opsonize them. Opsonization is a process by which antibody coated material or antibody coated pathogens can are engulfed macrophages and activate them further. So, anti capsular antibodies are therefore, used since polysaccharides inhibit phagocytosis. And of course, polysaccharides as I told you they are T independent and only memory B cells may be activated, but not T memory cells. Many of these approaches they have lack of 100 percent effectiveness and therefore, it affects what is called as herd immunity. This has actually seen examples during the breakup of the Soviet Union. Many of these vaccination of infants were discontinued because of obvious problems in vaccination because the whole country was breaking up. Now, because of that these diseases actually increased in the population and made many of the infants susceptible. So, this property of immunity in the whole population is termed as herd immunity and this can of course, vary because if you do not vaccinate when the child is born they become more and more susceptible and more individuals in a population become more susceptible as, as they become older. And another, another example of course, is mumps in, in the United Kingdom uh, went up quite a bit in 2004 and 2005, because the type of MMR vaccine that was used was altered just a couple of years earlier and that made mumps go up in the UK and then finally, the MMR vaccine was brought back to control such sort of uh, resurgence of certain uh, of mumps. Now, different kinds of vaccines can be made recombinant antigen vaccines use the recombinant DNA techniques to isolate and clone a gene of choice which is, which is from the pathogenic organism which can elicit the formation of either antibodies or T cells. They are put into expression vectors those which can express this antigen and like for example, bacteria or yeast or even mammalian cells once they are expressed they are purified and they are then used to immunize uh, an, ant, um, uh, an individual. For example, HBS surface antigen can be expressed in each cell yeast cells this has been known to produce neutralizing antibodies. One interesting aspect about yeast cells is that these antigens can be expressed on the surface of yeast cells and yeast of course, is something that is there in the normal food and one can use it for oral immunization also. HIV proteins, 
beta subunit of cholera toxin, enterotoxin of E. coli, circumsporozoic antigen of ma malarial parasite these are all examples where they have used recombinant DNA techniques to uh, express these antigens and uh, uh, purify large amounts of them and then give it uh, and immunize individuals. These are of course, treated as exogenous antigens by the immune system in, in uh, vis a vis the participation of MHC class 2 mediated responses. Because the humoral response is activated in response to uh, purified antigen exp, uh, expression, there is less of class 1 mediated response which involves the activation of cytotoxic T mediated killer cells. Therefore, they have come up with recombinant vector vaccines. You make a vector that can express a particular antigen of choice. You take this virus or vector and attenuate it by mutating the virus uh, mutating the antigen that actually causes the infection or which is responsible for its virulence and therefore, these virus attenuated viruses they can be engineered in such a way that the antigen of choice can be put into the genome of this uh, engineered uh, attenuated vector and the virus can be allowed to infect the individual and the wire because because of the attenuation the virus itself will not be able to cause uh, disease, but it will multiply because it has all the rest of the components um, uh, viral component that allow to infect the whole cell, but in the whole process the other antigens that have been cloned into this particular genome will be expressed in the mammalian cell or in that individual immunizing that individual against both a class 1 as well as a class 2 mediated response. So, some of the agents that have actually been used widely is vaccinia virus. Vaccinia virus has been used in a variety of cases for example, rabies uh, virus or rabies antigen some of these genes have been put into vaccinia virus and they have been used to infect uh, they have been used to immunize dogs and as well as as well as foxes in the forest to prevent rabies from from spreading. Canary pox virus, attenuated polio virus, adenoviruses these are all have been used as vectors. Even bacteria such as salmonella has been used uh, as attenuated vectors to express different kinds of antigens as well as BCG. Now, vaccines against infections going into this a little further attenuated organisms are prepared normally by, by passaging in different kinds of cells can actually revert. In fact, this is one of the reasons why attenuated vectors by using recombinant DNA techniques have been have been resorted to. So, for example, in type 3 Sabine polio vaccine this strain differs from the wild type at 10 at in 10 positions or 10 nucleotides out of a total of 7429 nucleotides means point mutations. Now, reversion causing neurovirulence has been noticed, but it, ha it has happened only very rarely, but even this rarity can cause havoc in a vaccinated individual because the individual becomes susceptible to death because of the neurovirulence and the bad effects of this particular uh, reversion. Therefore, in, in many, in many uh, situations during the history of vaccination many of these attempts or vaccination has actually been withdrawn for a couple of years and then brought back after verifying that it was it was not the bad effects were not because of the vaccination per se, but because of some other problems in the individual. Recombinant DNA technology has been used to create the attenuated strains as I alluded to in the earlier slide. So, the steps involved isolation of the specific virulence gene of that uh, of that uh, of that virus and mutage, mutagenize that particular gene in vitro. So, you take out the gene and you cause mutations in that particular gene, so that it is not able to cause the virulence again. So, then you take this particular gene and you replace the virulent gene of the wild type virus with this mutated gene by a process of recombination. So, you can actually get the mutated gene or a mutated DNA into the wild type virus in an infected cell and because both the DNA are there together together in the same in the same cell during the process of virus recombination of the DNA the mutated gene goes and recombines the region where there is a virulent gene and therefore, 
the genome that has got this mutated gene becomes avirulent. So, such sort of pro process involving homologous recombination has in fact been used in a variety of cases. The advantage being that these mutations can be so chosen so as to prevent reversion. And the examples being uh, uh, as the vaccine they were in for, in for example, influenza virus has been used in such cases where they mutated the viral polymerase uh, gene called as the P B 2. Now, as I told you earlier vaccinia viral vectors have been used as vaccines for hepatitis B virus, herpes simplex, influenza and rabies viruses. And salmonella strains have been used to express genes from all these are our different examples of what was just described in the earlier, uh, earlier uh, slides. For example, Vibrio cholera genes from Vibrio cholera have been have been expressed in salmonella strains. So, the advantage being that salmonella infects the gut or the mucosal immune system and many of these uh, organisms that are spread through the oro, oro fecal route benefit by using those kind of vectors that actually cause infection in the, in the, in the oro fecal root or in the gut. So, therefore, if one uses antigens um, that get expressed in the oro fecal root, it is, a, it is an advantage to having activate an immune response against those organisms that cause uh, infect through the oro fecal root mainly by IgA production and so on. So, DNA vaccines is another very very popular effort that is being tried out in the recent history. This is nothing but plasmid DNA that encodes for the antigen of choice. This is this plasmid DNA is actually injected directly into the muscle of the recipient and this has been found to protect individuals against various kinds of organisms and the exact manner of protection uh, has been debatable because uh, some of these uh, protect through a cell mediated immune response and some of them studies claim that there are there have been uh, activation of the production of antibodies uh, via DNA plasmid immunization. Now, this particular plasmid may integrate, it, integrate into the home host chromosomal DNA or remain as an episome that means outside of the genome, but because of this fear that this DNA may integrate into the host chromosomal DNA a lot of uh, skepticism uh, still remains as to the use of plasmid DNA although several efforts have, have, have shown that um, this sort of integration is uh, practically not there or um, not is, is does not happen all the time. Now, this particular DNA immunization has been used in, in what is called as a gene gun which enables the piercing of the particular plasmid along with microscopic gold particles which enhances the potential of this DNA to immunize an individual. So, these gold particles are, are, um, are used to coat the plasmid DNA and DNA vaccine effort of course, has involved a variety of antigens. Uh, one can look it up in any textbook uh, need not uh, uh, go into a detail in this vaccination class. The other aspects of the more popular the ones that are an interesting aspects that need to be um, uh, covered today is one of synthetic peptides. Now, these approaches have been tried for uh, in the case of influenza, HIV, diphtheria toxin, malaria parasite as well as hepatitis B virus. The, the, uh, the basics behind the use of synthetic peptides is that as one knows more and more about T cell and B cell immunology, one can look at what sort of as, as we know earlier that antigen presentation involves the presentation of small peptides and uh, as, as they are bound to the groove of the MHC molecule whether they are class 1 or class 2. So, one when one looks at the sequences of these peptides that are normally there on the, in the groove of the MHC molecule, one can take purified MHC molecules and elute these peptides from the MHC groove by a process of acid precipitation and then analyze them by mass spectrometry, uh, mass, uh, mass spectrometry to, to get at the sequence of these peptides. So, if one looks at these peptides, one gets an idea as to 
what sort of peptides may actually be found in protected individuals or protective alleles of the HLA, um, HLA molecule as opposed to those who are actually susceptible. So, you have now susceptible and resistant individuals or susceptible or resistant HLA alleles. So, if one looks at the sequence of the peptides that are bound in those grooves, one can try and say that these peptide sequence are more protective in a particular population. But of course, because of the variation or the number of HLA alleles, one is not able to come up with uh, a particular sequence of a peptide that is protective across the population. So, in such cases one looks for epitopes that bind to many, many HLA alleles, it is called as a promiscuous epitope. So, these sort of approaches have been used in order to construct synthetic peptides. So, if, if a particular uh, epitope is immunodominant in a particular HLA allele, if one knows that, uh, that the population has more of these HLA alleles, one can synthesize this particular uh, peptide, couple them to carriers and then use them as immunizing agents against those individuals in, in those individuals. In addition to this of course, you have a lot, a lot of algorithms or ways to predict B cell epitopes because uh, many antigens have been identified over a period of years in the history of immunology to look at what sort of epitopes are bound by different kinds of immunoglobulins. So, one can look at a particular sequence primary amino acid sequence of a protein and then come up with a particular hypothesis that this particular region can be immunogenic or dominant B cell epitopes. So, if that is given into the, uh, into the individuals or uh, um, used for vaccination, it would end up um, uh, eliciting the formation of beneficial antibodies. So, before which one can screen those synthetic peptides for reactivity to sera from resistant individuals. So, if those individuals who are resistant to a particular disease react to all of those synthetic peptides which have been prepared, then one is sure that such sort of a peptide can be used in a vaccine preparation. For example, in hepatitis B virus, there are cyclical repeat, uh, repeats of amino acid 139 to 147 has been used uh, in a vaccine preparation. Now, immunodominant T cell epitopes can also be identified and included in a vaccine to provide efficient T cell help. For example, class 2 molecule, HLA class 2 molecule can be looked at to see what sort of peptides are there. <coughs> this is in fact called as a reverse immunogenetics approach. Some of these uh, efforts have been useful in the case of HLA B53 allele, which shows that this B53 allele had always a proline in the second position. And this was useful against plasmodium fal uh, falciparum, because the peptide came from the plasmodium falciparum uh, 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 organism. So, they used this particular peptide from the uh, plasmodium which had proline in the second position to vaccinate against the, uh, the uh, against the stage of the parasite that infects the liver the hepatic stage. In addition to this of course, the multi subunit vaccines which uh, include multiple cop copies in order to try and optimize the mixture that would increase the immunogenicity of a particular antigen. For example, solid matrix antibody antigen complexes or what are called as SMAA uh, complexes, where you take a solid matrix like agarose or some such solid matrix and you couple an antibody against a particular antigen. And then you give that antigen that you want to immunize against. So, the antigen goes and couples to that antigen and this entire complex is used as an immunogen and this because it is a complex it activates the immune system and phagocytes, uh, phagocytes much better. In addition to that of course, using detergents you can prepare micelles along with the protein antigens mix them up and give them <coughs> to the individual. Liposomes are uh, preparations that you utilize phospholipid molecules along with the protein antigen of interest. So, you have a lipid bilayer that is prepared and the protein antigen is anchored in this uh, lipid bilayer of phospholipids. So, the hydrophobic portion is directed inside 
and the hydrophilic portion of the antigen is directed outside which uh, which when injected can stimulate or be bound by antibody bearing B cells or immunoglobulin receptor bearing B cells. In other in, in another attempt you, you have what is called as immunostimulating complexes which in a, just like liposomes which have all these different kinds of lipid material phospholipids it also has other material ca called as quillet along with the protein antigen of interest to stimulate again and deliver deliver these complexes to the cell to the cytosol of the cell. So, these immunosimulate or ISCOMs go and bind with the antigen presenting cell let us say dendritic cell and release the antigen into the cytosol the benefit be being that this can be taken up for a class 1 mediated antigen mediated response by the TAP protein or the transporter uh, associated with the antigen presentation. So, some of these things uh, HIV, HBV and HIV have been used in such examples. Of course, then you have come come coming to the anti idiotypic vaccines which I uh, will cover to just up to these uh, two slides. This is the peptide that is bound to the class 1 molecule and this can be eluted as I told you and the sequence is worked out. So, you can that is what I meant in the previous slide that you can look at the uh, look at the sequence for example, HLA B, B 53 was experimented in this way in this reverse immunogenetics approach. This is just to show you in the mouse a particular strain of mouse called as bulb C. If you elude those peptides from the class 1 molecule you will see that these are called as dominant anchor residues. The tyrosine is always there in the second position isoleucine or leucine is there in the ninth position. So, if you look at the antigen and you have tyrosine in the second position isoleucine and leucine in the ninth position you can at least hypothesize although it may not be 100 percent true that these particular nonopeptides are always going to be bound to the class 1 molecule, but many of these uh, peptides are in fact bound to the class 1 molecule. So, anti idiotypes anti idiotypes antibody uh, you have already learned that it serves as an internal image of an antigen. What is this uh, anti idiotype? If you look at the antibody you have the F C portion and you have the way the light chains attached here by disulfide bonds. Now, because of their variable nature they themselves can be a foreign antigen in a particular individual. In fact, the immune system is supposed to be controlled in a feedback regulatory loop by having an antibody and an anti antibody being formed because an antibody is being uh, made against a particular pathogen. So, they find that this antibody all these variable regions can make a conglomeration of epitopes which elicit the formation of anti antibodies. So, this um, collection of these variable region epitopes is all is called as the idiotype. So, if you make anti if you make antibodies to these variable regions they have found that many of these uh, anti idiotypes actually are surrogate antigens. In fact, many of these um, uh, anti idiotype has in fact been used to try and see how we can suppress allergy, but in the case of vaccination you can make use this as an internal image of the antigen and generate antibodies to virulent pathogens without using the pathogen itself that is the advantage of using anti idiotypes. So, there has been protection observed against hepatitis, Sendai, E. coli, streptococcus pneumoniae, listeria monocytogenes, trypanosoma rhodiensi, schistosoma mansoni. These are all the pathogens where anti idiotypes have in fact been used to protect against these diseases. So, protection has been observed by using these anti idiotypic approaches of course, in animals. Other pathogens that have been exp experimented with are rabies, tobacco mosaic virus, polio type 2, rio virus and trypanosoma cruzi. However, although you had the formation of antibodies uh, in such situations protective immunity did not result in these examples. So, in order to summarize this class we need to look at several aspects of the immune response that has been uh, activated against a variety of um, uh, organisms by the active process of immunizing or passive process of immunization. But before that a simple little bit about adjuvants which are used to increase responses to immune responses to an antigen. They enhance immunogenicity of antigens 
or uh, vaccines. So, they are given along with the vaccines. One of the popular ones that are used in mice is Freund's complete adjuvant, which is nothing but the mural, muramyl dipeptide that is present in the bacterial cell wall. In fact, you have heat killed mycobacteria in this Freund's complete adjuvant. The adjuvant activity is by a process of a depot effect or a delayed release of this antigen because mineral oil also is incorporated into, into these adjuvants. And in addition to that of course, is the activation of macrophages because these muramyl dipeptides activate macrophages. Other one is the Bordetella pertussis antigen which is also acts as a um, as an adjuvant material to activate macrophages. Bacterial polysaccharides and heat shock proteins as well as DNA these all have been used as, as adjuvants. They act on basically antigen presenting cells in order to increase their activity to increase phagocytosis as well as micropinocytosis. The LPS derivative because LPS by itself is very toxic at very small doses it cannot be used as an adjuvant, but some of the components of LPS has been purified called as monophosphoryl lipid A it is a TLR, TLR 4 ligand. Similarly, CPG uh, motifs of DNA uh, binds to TLR 9 lipoprotein components of gram positive bacteria bind to TLR 2 and of course, the muramyl dipeptides bind to the NOT 2 receptor. So, all these various kinds of adjuvants have been used in addition to this the co-injection of IL 12 some of the cytokines have been used for a variety of diseases not only by, by exogenous administration, but also as a co-fusion with the particular gene that that you want to immunize against. So, if IL 12 gene is juxtaposed to a particular gene of interest then the IL, IL 12 is also say, um, made at that time um, activating a pro inflammatory kind of uh, situation in vivo. So, they can also be these, these kinds of targeting approaches have been used um, uh, in this particular slide they can coat antigen with particular kinds of residues like for example, mannose to couple it to uh, home it to uh, mannose receptors, immune complexes via the FC receptors, DNA vaccination as I told you have been made as a fusion product with CTLA 4. So, that they can bind to B 7 and co cause co stimulator activation and so on and so forth. In addition to that uh, fusion with a signal peptide, so that they can be targeted to the MHC 2 pathway. So, summarizing of course, you have all these different kinds of attempts which are basically aimed at strengthening the immune response. Both innate and adaptive immune response are targeted to improve this approach and of course, you manipulate the pathogen to make it less virulent, purified components are used, exogenous and simultaneous intervention with cytokines are being tried as I just mentioned and cytokines to be used also will then depend upon the specific examples and the disease because each one of us respond differently to different kinds of organisms. So, while certain kinds of cytokines can actually trigger a cascade which is involving pro inflammatory and cause pro inflammation cause deleterious side effects others may not have the same kind of response. So, therefore, you see that a, man, a variety of efforts are in fact moving towards a kind of a personalization of, of medicine although that is a far way off. Thank you very much.